Do you recognize this man? He looks like he looks like every other stock car driver. No, nothing physically distinctive about him. I talked to him briefly at Talladega that day with Sterling, but he didn't make any any particular impression on me. Like I say, nothing really stands out physically about him or or any any other way. He's just just a, a driver that was trying to race at Talladega. It's race day at Alabama International Motor Speedway in Talladega. This is the world's fastest speedway, over 200 miles an hour. We may be in store for the fastest 500 mile race in auto racing history. It's one of the most compelling, intriguing stories because it's a mystery. It's gonna be a wide open, exciting, wild afternoon. Everybody loves a mystery. A newcomer to Winston Cup Racing, L.W. Wright, from Nashville, Tennessee, the Music City Racing Chevrolet. This is probably the biggest mystery in the history of NASCAR. Who was L.W. Wright? What was he trying to do? How did he manage to pull it off? And where is he now? In the years that have passed, it's only become more mysterious. This guy that showed up and then disappeared into the mist. I see Hollywood movie scripts all over this one. This guy is a ghost. On April 25th, 1982, in the Sunday edition of a Nashville, Tennessee newspaper, there's a quick note near the bottom of a motorsports column. A local NASCAR driver is racing next week in Talladega with help from some country music stars. It's largely unremarkable, except for one important detail. Nearly the entire story is made up. To understand why, let's set the scene. The 80s are just getting underway. It's a time of excess and optimism where it seems like anything is possible. NASCAR is no different. The sport is exploding in popularity and attention. All that growth makes everyone want a piece of the pie. Sponsors were getting into it. Money was, was becoming a factor. Publicity was becoming a factor. The door was probably more open in the early 80s than ever before. Every week, there are new faces at the track, wanting to be the next Darrell Waltrip. A man named L.W. Wright is one of them. But he has no team, no car, and more importantly, no money. It's two weeks before the Winston 500 at Talladega. To make the race, the first thing he needs is money. Lots of it. A Nashville company named Space Age Marketing is looking to make a name for itself. Its owner, Bernie Terrell, wants to make a splash. He knows nothing about NASCAR. But our aspiring star sells him on the growing sport and his racing ability then somehow convinces a man he just met to hand over $37,500 on the spot. That's over $100,000 in today's money. How? It really was uncommon that a driver could show up and raise that much in funds. I think it was all about being a smooth talker. The person that was making the purchase knew very little about the sport but he was sold on a bright future and a beautiful picture. The whole sport revolved around the mighty dollar more so then than it does now. If race people believe there's a dollar to be found somewhere, they'll chase anybody, anywhere, just to get that buck. Pockets flush with cash, L.W. goes searching for a ride. He finds his way into the garage of one of Nashville's chosen sons. NASCAR legend Sterling Marlin. LW says he's going racing at Talladega next weekend and has a stack of cash to pay for a car. Sterling is skeptical of his big talk, but eventually agrees to sell his 81 Monte Carlo for $17,000 in cash and a $3,700 check. 
Sterling, his curiosity piqued by the cocky mystery man, has one last condition. He wants to be his crew chief in Talladega. LW agrees, and just like that, Music City Racing is born. Sterling was just a local racer around Nashville, and he was not the NASCAR star that we know today. Sterling Marlin's going to win it. Sterling may have said, hey, I've got this guy willing to pay money. Why not sell it to him? I think Sterling just really hung out with him trying to get his money. In uh, 1982, I was a, a sports writer for the Nashville Tennessean, and so that's kind of how I got involved with our, uh, our story. The first thing any new team needs is attention. Enter Larry Woody, a legendary motorsports journalist in Nashville. LW gives Larry a call to create some hype for his upcoming race. He says he's a veteran Grand National driver with a new team. And he's sponsored by country music legends Merle Haggard and T.G. Shepard. That five-minute phone call becomes the news story from earlier. Remember how it was all made up? Well... One of T.G.'s uh, representatives called and said T.G. had no idea who this guy was. In the 80s, Gary Baker is a big deal in Nashville. He owns Bristol and Nashville Fairground Speedways is friends with a bunch of drivers, and is a high-powered attorney for half the country stars in the city, including T.G. Shepard. When Gary sees the story, he immediately calls up Larry Woody. If there was going to be any involvement with T.G. Shepard, I would have been the first to know about it, because I would have been the one that would have been negotiating it. So when I heard that, I immediately told Larry Woody, something is real fishy here. But you don't just throw names out there and, and hope something sticks. That's not the way it works. It was a bunch of smoke. So I call back L.W. Wright to see what's going on, and he kind of squirms around and says, well, I was probably a little premature with the T.G. Shepard and Merle Haggard announcements. We're still doing some negotiating about getting a sponsorship set up, but it's, it's not finalized. So in other words, he's a, a pretty smooth talker. If you ask him a tough question, he could sort of slide his way out of it. Gary Baker, during that period of time, was the most powerful man in motorsports in the state of Tennessee. And Gary was well respected. For LW to say he came out of Nashville and Gary knows nothing about it, that just tells me LW was skirting all of the establishment. You know, this guy is a ghost. L.W. heads to the NASCAR credential office to get a license to drive. Suspicious of the new guy, the official asks for his racing history. L.W. lists modest accomplishments at distant tracks years earlier. It's good enough, and he hands over a check and gets his license. Soon after, though, holes start appearing in his story again. According to the drivers, none of them had ever heard of the guy. I said, uh, L.W., these guys that you've supposedly raced against don't know you. I misspoke. I didn't really run on the top series. I raced on big tracks, but they were lower level races. He sort of weaseled his way out. Drivers, they're like fishermen. They exaggerate. So it wasn't that unusual to sort of embellish uh, the, the stories a bit. In the early 80s, this is how primitive record keeping was. And I would call in and get the finishing results each night. It was like detective work every weekend. Sometimes I'd call a track and never get an answer. And I was like, what happened? I think it would have been near impossible to track down a person's credentials. The world that we live in today they can't understand how you can just let a guy go wild in a race car at 200 miles an hour. But in 1981, 82, that's the way this sport worked. You got a car, get out there and run it as hard as you can. If it's fast enough, you can race. If it's not fast enough, then you're going to go home. All of LW's rule bending has led to this moment, on the precipice of racing at Talladega. But first, he has to qualify. Benny Parsons becomes the first driver ever to break 200 miles per hour in qualifying. 
the speed is intense. I went into the infield, and that's the first time I'd met him face to face. We were chatted a few minutes, and then he went out to, to qualify. He just went out and held the pedal down and made a lap. Somehow, LW and his two-week-old team pull it off and qualify for the fastest race of the year. But it's not all roses. He wrecks on his second lap. With no backup car, Sterling is forced to put it back together for the race. And to make matters worse, LW is already looking lost behind the wheel. He doesn't know some of the simplest things that you'd think that a driver would know if he had any experience. But he still qualified for the race. After Sterling pieces the car back together, a team that didn't exist a few weeks ago miraculously races on the biggest track in NASCAR. Welcome to Alabama International Motor Speedway, Talladega, the world's fastest race course. The slowest car in the field had to run 186 miles an hour just to get into the starting lineup. Gives you an idea of the caliber of drivers the speed we'll see here today. Once he started the race, he was in a hornet's nest. It doesn't take long for things to start going wrong. After an early restart, leaders need only three laps to catch and lap LW. He just can't keep up. It's obvious that, that he is way over his head. NASCAR recognizes this guy is a danger on the track. The flagman is waving the black flag for him to get out of the way. NASCAR officials said, you're done. The black flag coming off of one of the back markers, perhaps a little bit of inexperience on the young driver. Well, he's not that young, but inexperience in terms of his years in Grand National driving. It's calamity after calamity after calamity. There's one common denominator, and that's LW. He pulls into pit road and is done after only 13 laps. Sometimes when people do things like this, the game is making it happen. It's not really the end result. And that's when he disappears into thin air. L.W. Wright leaves the car in Talladega and vanishes into the night. You probably saw this coming, but it turns out L.W. didn't just lie about his racing experience or country music stars. The checks he wrote start bouncing left and right. The check he gave Goodyear for tires, the license money to NASCAR, thousands to his landlord. All of it is worthless. In all, he made off with more than $50,000. I asked Sterling about it, and he said he wasn't surprised when the check bounced. He knew that some of the characters coming in and out of the track were not always the pillars of society. That's why he wanted $17,000 in cash. NASCAR reports LW to the police, and a warrant is quickly issued. At the same time, Bernie Terrell, the man who lost the most of anyone, hires his own private detective to track him down. But all the info they have on him turns out to be dead ends, including the name LW Wright. It's like he never existed. Meanwhile, his story begins to receive national attention, something all parties want to minimize. I think the more notoriety the case drew, the more they have been like, you know, is this really worth it to pursue this guy just like the streaker that the TV camera won't cover? We don't want this L.W. Wright to get any more press than, than he's already gotten. Even the private investigator couldn't find him. He called me one day to see if I had any leads, and I said, no, I don't. I said, if you find him, let me know. I'd like to, like to do the rest of the story. If this had been a legit team, I would have known about that operation. I never heard <laughs> the names Space Age Marketing, Music City Racing in my life. This again was just a ghost team as much as he was a ghost driver. He's sort of the, the D.B. Cooper of, of auto racing. He, he pulled a, something off that most people wouldn't have had the, the guts or the courage to try. You got to give the guy credit to, to get on Talladega and drive around that track. I, I wouldn't do it. There's so many hoops you have to jump through now to even get a NASCAR license. You could never pull that off again. 
Nearly 40 years later, we're still no closer to learning the identity of L.W. Wright. But everyone has their own theories of who he was and why he did what he did. One is that he was a legitimate race driver who had raced in some lower divisions, get to Talladega, maybe do well, get his foot in the door. Years later, he'd sit around and chuckle about some of the things he had to do to work his way into the sport. Another would be he did it for the money. Or maybe he was just a thrill seeker who wanted to uh, see if he could do it. There's one, one other explanation, as Barney Fife used to say, maybe he was a nut. <laughs> I think this may have started as bar talk. He was going to show his friends that, hey, I can get out there and run. L.W. may be sitting somewhere today going, I raced at Talladega, and that's something nobody else in this room can say. Do you recognize this man? His face looks a little familiar. He looks like every other stock car driver. He's got the big Winston cap with the bill down. He's got the bushy hair, the long sideburns, which everybody wore back then. Pretty much a traditional Southern guy. He looks a little weather, weather beaten. These guys lived a rough and tumble life. That man does not look familiar to me at all. Could have been my long lost uncle. I wouldn't know it. Will we ever solve the mystery of L.W. Wright? I met somebody at Talladega briefly who said they were L.W. Wright, and I talked to somebody on the phone two or three times who said they were L.W. Wright. Nobody knows for sure to this day who L.W. Wright was. I suspect nobody will ever know. If we could ever find the guy sat down, it would be the most intriguing thing in the world to see what was making him tick. LW, if you're watching this, give, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>